What's up, YouTube? This is the 82 and 0 podcast. Continuing on, players that have been forgotten with time, we're taking a look at Maurice Stokes. Now, Maurice Stokes was born June 17, 1933, and he was born in Rankin, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. He was one of four children. He had a twin sister and two brothers. His father worked in a steel mill, and his mother was a domestic worker. When Maurice was age 8, the family moved to nearby Homewood, where he later attended Westington High School. Stokes did not start in his first two years at Westington because in his last two years he helped the Bulldogs to back-to-back city championships in 1950 and 1951. Now, Stokes would attend and graduate from St. Francis College in Loretto, Pennsylvania. There he led the Red Flash to a 1955 National Division Tournament. He was named the most valuable player, although this time finishing fourth in the tournament. In his first college season, Stokes averaged 23.1 points per game and 26.5 rebounds per game. The following season, he averaged 27.1 points per game and 26.2 rebounds per game. Stoke remained in St. Francis an all-time rebounder with 1,819 and in his his second in scoring in 2,282. The Red Flash were 73-9 during Stoke's four seasons. He was later inducted into the St. Francis University Athletic Hall of Fame. Now going into his professional career, he would be drafted by the Cincinnati Royals. He was the he was the second pick overall in the 1955 draft. And this Cincinnati Royals team, this is prior to Oscar Robertson arriving there. This team had like Jack Twyman. The team had won a title back in 1951, but they haven't really been able to get back. And I should mention they were called the Rochester Royals before being called the the Cincinnati Royals. They changed the name Cincinnati his final year there. So in his first season in the 55-56 season in Rochester, he puts up 16.8 points per game, 16.3 rebounds per game, 4.9 assists, and he's an all-star in his first season. Now, Rochester it didn't really translate in wins because Rochester would only go 31-41 and 41 for the record. They didn't make the playoffs. Uh, to name some other guys on his team, he had Ed Fleming, Bob Wisner, Richie Reagan. You know, not really any good players other than Marie Stokes and Jack Twyman. Now, going into the 56-57 season, they would improve somewhat in terms of the team getting better. Like Jack Twyman would start to average more points. Cy Green was there now. But it didn't translate in wins. They only went 31 and 41. And they didn't make the playoffs. Now Murray Stokes would play his final year in Cincinnati. And he'd put up 16.3 points, 18.1 rebounds, 6.4 assists. Cincinnati, it was the final game of the season, and he got hit on the head during a regular season game. He drove to the basket, and he was struck unconscious. You know, it was a clean foul. They just got a little too rough. They didn't mean to, and he was knocked unconscious, and he was revived with smelling salts and returned to the game. This is how the game was played back then. You know, they would never do this today. They would never have a guy unconscious go back out there. But this is how barbaric the NBA was during the time. So he was revived with smelling salts and he returns to the game. However, three days later, after recording 12 points and 15 rebounds in the opening round playoff game against the Detroit Pistons, which keep in mind, this is his first playoff appearance, he became ill on the team's flight back to Cincinnati. Stokes later suffered a seizure and was left permanently paralyzed. He was diagnosed with post-traumatic entheology, a brain injury that caused dramatic motor control center. So, during the years that followed, Stokes would be supported and cared for by his lifelong friend and teammate, Jack Twyman. So, Jack Twyman would become his legal guardian, and he 
would take care of him. He lived with his family. Although permanently paralyzed, Stokes was mentally alert and communicated by blinking his eyes. He adopted a grueling physical therapy regimen that eventually allowed him to limited physical movement, and he eventually regained the limited speaking ability. Stokes' condition deteriorated throughout the 60s and was later transferred to Good Samaritan Hospital in Cincinnati, where Twyman continued to be a regular visitor. However, 12 years after the post-traumatic injury that left him in a coma, he died at the age of 36 from a heart attack on April 6, 1970. And after this, he would have a Catholic funeral at his own request. He was buried in Franciscan Frere Cemetery near the campus of St. Francis. Now, he left a long-lasting legacy. Despite only playing three years, he was on his way to becoming one of the best players in the league. And here's a crazy fact. After Jack Twyman became his legal guardian, he organized a charity exhibition game in 1958 to help raise funds for Stokes' medical expenses. Because you got to keep in mind, this is before the million-dollar contracts that would follow. So, Twyman wasn't doing this for his own gain. He just wanted to be able to pay his medical bills and help him out. Becoming And it became an annual tradition back then. It was called the, the Marie Strokes Memorial Basketball Game. It was later changed to Marie Stokes slash Wilt Chamberlain Celebrity Pro-Am Golf Tournament due to the NBA insurance company's restrictions regarding athletes. So, Wilt would kind of lead the, uh, head this up after that. Stokes' life injury and relationship with Twyman are all depicted in a 1973 general picture film called Murray, which I encourage everybody to go check that out. It's really great. And it just shows the character that Twyman had. He didn't have any obligation to take care of his teammate, to be his guardian, but he did. And if you watch interviews with Twyman and his family, they said uh, they said that Maurice Stokes was full of life up until the time of his death. He didn't have any self-pity. He was still he was still smiling, having fun in life. And he said he taught him a lot. And he was like a brother to him. That's beautiful, you know? So, another interesting fact, there's a Maurice, the Maurice Strokes Athletic Center, which is built in, a, it's like a physical education building. It opened in 1971 on the St. Francis University campus, named after him. Now, who knows what kind of player he would have became, because... He was already a three-time All-Star in his career, just in that short career, and he was even in MVP conversations for some of those years. He was great well-rounded, great rebounder, great passer, gifted all the way around. And it's sad how we lost a player who, he was only 36 when he died, and he was only 24 when he was out of the NBA. It's really sad to see something like that. And it's sad how time has consumed him because if if he would have lived and if he would have stayed healthy, we would have been talking about Wilt Chamberlain, Bill Russell, and Maurice Stokes. He's in that conversation. So rest in peace, Maurice Stokes. Gone but never forgotten. Died April 6, 1970. Let me know your thoughts down below. Thank you for watching. Imagine going to bed on a Saturday night, at the peak of your game, your, uh, uh, your future is so bright, and waking up on a Sunday morning, totally paralyzed. Uh, nothing worked, not knowing why. Uh, how would you react? How would I react? I don't know. Certainly, one of the top forwards I'd ever seen play was Maurice Stokes, who was, had the very unfortunate accident, and, and it was a tragic uh, uh, ending to a great, great career. But what a super basketball player he was, and, and just fantastic. And he certainly uh, uh, will be or, or should have been a member of the Hall of Fame. He's, he's one of the top forwards I'd ever seen play. Maurice, had he been able to continue his career, would have been the dominant player in professional basketball history. Uh, if you think about a, a fellow 6'7", uh, playing at about 275 that could dribble the length of the floor, play guard, forward, take it in the pivot, do whatever had to be done on the basketball floor. 
There aren't too many of those people that have ever played the game. After a week or two, I asked him, what did you think about when you were aware of what your situation was? He said very simply, I had one of two choices. I could have quit, or I could have rolled up my sleeves and used every ounce of energy that I had to beat this thing, whatever it was. And for the next 12 years, that's exactly what he did. His regimen was something that you couldn't imagine. Starting at nine in the morning, going till six at night, in physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, and at the same time, keeping abreast of current events, and, and, and never, ever in the 12 years did I ever see him depressed, or angry, or why me, or how did this happen? He looked forward to the new day every day, and he was an amazing person. He inspired everybody that came in contact with him. Tonight is kind of bittersweet. I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of Maurice. He belongs in the Hall of Fame. He was a great player. I'm a little sad that he isn't here. And in closing, let me just say, congratulations, big fella. You made it.